It's Wednesday, March 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. I'm Bob Harris. It's time for On the Hot Seat. Uh, but first, footballguys.com is the website. Uh, appreciate you coming here every Wednesday at this time for On the Hot Seat. Saturdays also for the Ask Me Anything uh, videos that we like to do here. I love your questions. Uh, hit the subscribe button, the notification bell, all the youtube stuff that YouTube demands to make the algorithm happy. Makes me happy. Makes you happy. Makes my guest happy. And that's very important. Uh, we're right on the cusp of some serious uh, NFL and hence fantasy football uh, action. So uh, I wanted to bring somebody on way smarter than I am to discuss all the possibilities. He is the 2023 FSWA Fantasy Football Writer of the Year. His name is Adam Harstad. He's from Football Guys. You can follow him on the X at Adam Harstad, A-D-A-M-H-A-R-S-T-A-D. Adam, thanks so much for coming on, man. Yeah, happy to. So let's talk a little bit. Like, So I've been hearing about you for a very long time from our mutual friend, Matt Waldman. Many people here on the channel know Matt from his appearances here, his regular showings. Uh, look at there, Mr. Scamper's here. Uh, hello, Dame, Royal Slade, Anthony. Thanks, for, thanks everyone for coming. Appreciate y'all. Um, Matt Waldman has spoken highly of you for a very long time, said you're a unique character. Then I met you in person, and Matt is like the master of understatement, it turns out. You are a unique character. Fascinating guy, uh, a lot of knowledge of data. So I think the first thing I want to ask you, and by the way, congratulations on the FSWA award. Uh, Well-deserved. I did that too. 2004, I was the very I first. I know, you were the very first. Writer. So yes, so we, got the we, have a right little, here. we have a little link here. Yes. Uh, so I, I do think it's interesting, though, something that I like, I have an impression of you. And by the way, you know, start out, just tell us a little bit about the journey, how, how you got here. Yeah, so um, I did not really watch football growing up. I grew up in Colorado um, and I was born shortly after John Elway was drafted. Uh, so football was big, uh, and every, it was kind of just always in the background, but like, I was not specifically paying attention to it other than, you know, I'd catch a game here or there. It was exciting, um, when they won the Super Bowls in the nineties. Um, but I was kind of a nerdy dorky kid, not really into athletic pursuits, more into video games around 2000. I made some friends with some people on a video game message board. And one of them a guy named Tom said, uh, Hey, have you ever heard of this fantasy football thing? And I said, uh, nope, never heard of it. And he said, you know, I think it might be up your alley. Let's give it a shot. Um, and this is back when there was no such thing as free league hosts. You either um, ran the league by hand yourself, uh, which I've done that for a few leagues, um, or you could pay like CBS for like 300 bucks a year. They would run your fantasy league for you. Um, and he offered to pay my entry fees. Um, I got into it. It wasn't really good, um, but I kind of got hooked and I got better over time. And um, so I always say, you know, I always say on Twitter that like, I like doing favors for strangers because at one point in time in, in my past, you know, a stranger did a favor for me. He invited me to a fantasy football league. He paid my entry fee, paying 30 bucks for a kid he'd never actually met. Um, and it, it dramatically changed the trajectory of my life. So uh, yeah, I tell people don't underrate um just how big of an impact it can have to just do like one random act of kindness to a stranger it's really funny because i think people do overlook it i i you know it's i try not i i try to follow that same model like you know i've been doing this a long time i have information to share with people i'm happy when people ask me about it and i'm happy to share the information they can do with what, what they want but i think the kindness aspect of this whole thing if you're out there on the x device people uh, you see like not enough kindness, right? And uh, everyone's out there trying to build some kind of cloud or, you know, gain some some kind of traction, uh, you know, often through less than kind gestures or drawing attention to themselves with with the hottest of hot takes. And, uh, uh, you know, not my lane. Everyone here knows this. And, and I was, you know, and by the way, we're going to talk about my uh, we're going to talk about my time off. Uh, I went on vacation, but the vacation never happened. We're going to talk about that Saturday. I got, I got on vacation. I took time off, but we'll get more into that. So, so one of the things that I think is, you know, like the, the impression I have of you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Like you're the guy, when I sit here and I build a narrative and I tell myself a happy story about a player, you're going to come and deliver the, the, the data that either totally debunks and makes me feel incredibly foolish, or you're going to like give me some degree of hope. You love the data. You're super adept at coming up with it. And I feel like you love like coming in and crushing people's narratives when they're a little bit offline. 
It's funny. I always say that um, the film guys think I'm a data guy and the data guys like just absolutely don't because I mean, I can speak several languages and I kind of understand. I've got a little bit of background in various different things. Um, but for me, the reason I love football, the reason I love fantasy football is for the narratives. It's for the story. It's um, John Facenda and Steve Sabol and the autumn wind is a Raider. And like, it's really the only sport like that where you're getting the narrative through line, not just from game to game, but from play to play too. You know, it, in baseball, each at bat is kind of atomized. It's just its own little thing that exists in its own little universe. And then it's over and it's done. Whereas football, like a good play caller, a guy like Kyle Shanahan, he's telling a story. He's saying, you know, look at what I'm doing here. Now on the next play, look at what I did last time and pay attention to that. You know, whereas the other hand on the other side is going to be doing something completely different. Um, so I love a good story and, and um, I love a bad story. I love all sorts of stories. That's to me, fantasy football is a cool or like emergent storytelling. Like it's, it's these stories that we're creating amongst ourselves um, to kind of to mark the time. Um, so no, I'm not I'm not really big on um, like crushing people's narratives because I'm a big fan of narratives. Uh, and and certainly I wouldn't want to, you know, like crush or destroy anything. But I do think that for me personally, if I'm going to believe something, I would rather it be true. Uh, and so, you know, like if I see some people who believe things that I think might not necessarily be maximally true, I might gently step in and offer some more background or context. And, and if I kind of get the sense that like, they just want to believe what they believe and they don't care whether it's true or not, that's totally valid. I, there's no judgment there that absolutely you just keep doing your thing. I'm going to keep doing my thing. Everybody's going to be happy. Well, I think I kindly just ask you to, to crush my narratives when they're wrong. Cause I think, especially this time of year. More so than any other. I mean, I don't know if you're drafting this early, Adam. I jump in the best ball rooms as soon as they open. Uh, because not because I feel like I'm going to draft the uh, ideal team at this time of year, because I know I'm not. And uh, and I just want to be steeped in the subject and kind of have an understanding of how values evolve and change over time, how we view things, how to build my narratives. But I mean, when you're drafting this time of year, you're telling yourself some happy stories uh based on possibilities more so than realities uh so we're heading into a time of year when there's going to be a lot of change a lot of upheaval how do you how do you approach you know what is your view of like change let's say you know when you're assessing a quarterback going to a new situation what is the step-by-step -step as you look at that quarterback and assess him in his new home yeah i think looking at any new situation the two things i want to ask myself are can i believe something and must i believe so for instance, you know, Russell Wilson just released by the Denver Broncos. Let's say he lands with, I don't know, the Atlanta Falcons, just to pick a team at random. I'm, there's no insider information. He hasn't, to my knowledge, credit linked there, but let's say he lands on the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, and so I'm looking at, you know, like what's Russell Wilson going to do this year? What's Drake London going to do this year? Um, and the can I believe something is going to be something like, you know, Russell Wilson, prior to joining the Broncos, was on a Hall of Fame trajectory, uh, was one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, was one of the best fantasy quarterbacks in the NFL, um, in large part due to um, non-trivial rushing contributions. And he had a down year in Seattle, and then he had two down years in Denver. He rebounded a little bit in the second year, but just not to his previous standard. And so the can I believe something is like, can I convince myself that it's okay to believe that Russell Wilson is going to be back to his prior form because I would love that. I would love that if Russell Wilson, you know, the, the more great quarterbacks there are in the NFL, the better it is for everyone, the better it is for um, <clears> fantasy <throat> and for, for fans who are watching. And um, so that's, that's the, can I believe it? Can I believe that Russell Wilson is going to be back to his old self? And if so, what's that going to look like? What's that going to look like for Drake London, Kyle Pitts, B. John Robinson, and so on. Uh, and then there's the must, I believe something, which is, um, you know, Russell Wilson has been trending downwards. Must I believe that this is a trend? Is, is if I look at the historical evidence, is it okay for me to think that, you know, maybe that was just an outlier and he's going to rebound? Who are the other examples in the past that we've <laughs> seen of quarterbacks who have had down stretches like that? You know, I could cite Kurt Warner and Philip Rivers, and then I might compare and be like, well, yeah, but Rivers' downstretch was really just a year or two. It wasn't as long as Wilson's. And um, Warner kind of had extenuating circumstances because he was bouncing teams. And uh, so that's a lot of my process is, is I'm looking at historically comparable players um, and situations 
trying to find out like what I have to believe and what I'm allowed to believe. And then once I've done that, then, you know, uh, I, I find where my actual opinion settles in. It's just got to be between those two poles. So we have a question from JSC and I'm going to kind of spin off this. There was a player you got it for a cheaper price before that, you know, you won't get a value again. DJ Moore last year, great example of that. I think a lot of wide receivers are great examples of that because as we're sitting here telling ourselves our happy or unhappy stories, we put way too much emphasis on less than ideal quarterbacks or we overvalue, we, we put too much weight on the notion that the, that a less than ideal quarterback situation maybe means like no quarterback at all. I want to spin this over to a player though, that kind of fits the mold of what you were talking about is, is uh, Stefan Diggs in Buffalo. What is Stefan Diggs right now to you? You know, you look at it, it was like a nine game stretch, I guess, where he, you know, came up way short, uh, far short. And they're like, it's a multivariable equation. Maybe it was him, maybe the scheme, uh, you know, various things came into play there. But, but when we look back on his career, we're going to say, wow, Stefan Diggs had that little blip on the radar. That was not great. And the people who are drafting this year in the fifth round are going to be very happy. Or are you thinking we're seeing the start of something um, bigger here? Yeah. Back in 2015, um, I did a big study on the question of like, how do players age? Um, and you've been doing fantasy football long enough. I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of age curves, yep. uh, which you just average together the production of everybody at age 23, everybody at age 24, everybody at age 25 and on and on. And you plot it on a graph and it creates like a bell curve. You know, players come in, they start at a low level, they ascend, they reach their peak, and then they they descend and they decline until they're done and they're out of the league. And um, lots of people have done this. You can look and like the peak age for running backs is 25. The peak age for wide receivers is 28. And everything after that's a decline. Um, and age curves are, are narratively very satisfying. Uh, the only real problem with them is not actually true. Uh, and if you look at careers, NFL careers, they're very, very, very rarely curve shaped. Uh, and so there's this thing called ecological fallacy, where if you average together an entire population, that average will display properties that are not the same as the properties of the individual members of the group. Like just because the group as a whole behaves a certain way doesn't mean that the individuals in that group behave that way. Um, so when I looked at wide receivers, um, I, I just used a simple measure of fantasy value over replacement, which I, I find like the waiver wire replacement points per game, say it's like eight points per game. That's what you can get off of waivers. Um, and it's just points per game minus that replacement level times games played. Uh, so it's basically how much value is this player adding to your team? And I looked at, um, the top 50 wide receivers from 1985 to 2014, and I just asked how many of them were worse in their last fantasy relevant season than they were in their second to last fantasy relevant season. And if careers were curve shaped, you would expect that they're trending down. Like they're predominantly worse in their last season than they were in their second to last season. Um, but the answer is 50%, which is what you'd expect if it's really just a coin flip. Like there's no, basically wide receivers just kind of truck along. They have their set performance level and they just fluctuate above and below that set performance level until one day um, they're just done. They just don't have it anymore. You think about like Andre Johnson is a great example of this. Um, Andre Johnson in Houston is great. He's great. He's great. He's great. He goes to Indianapolis and he's done overnight, like just, just dust basically. Um, so Stefan Diggs, the fact that he had a down year last year, I don't think it really means all that much. Um, if he hasn't hit that, that cliff, I call it an age cliff instead of an age curve, but if he hasn't hit that age cliff yet, it's likely it's just a blip. Like most, like half of receivers wind up improving in their final season before they finally fall from relevance. So it wouldn't really surprise me at all if Stephon Diggs came out and had another 1500 yard, 14 touchdown type of season. Um, I think that's very much within his range of outcomes. I wouldn't want to bet on it over someone like Justin Jefferson or someone like right. CD lamb who did it recently where there's not that question of like, has he perhaps hit the cliff? Um, but once we're past like the surefire, like no real question, bulletproof receivers, um, I, I'm really interested in older guys, um, especially at receiver. You know, at running back, there is a little bit of evidence that declines might be real. Um, <clears throat> but at receiver, it's mostly just just a random walk. It's just random fluctuation. Uh, so I think Diggs is actually a really interesting guy to bet on in this upcoming year. And, you know, maybe it doesn't pay off, but 
that's kind of fantasy football for you. It's just a series of educated bets. Right. I think that's, that's the key right there. And I, you know, as I look at some of the wide receivers or some of the wide receiver values in early best ball drafts, I see guys, you know, like Keenan Allen going way later than they should. And maybe some of that's uncertainty, right? I mean, I think that's fair. Like there are people concerned about the change of the coordinator, a more run heavy approach, also his age, also the cap situation. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of moving pieces to a player like that. Mike Evans, we're getting a little certainty on him, but you're seeing him go fairly late too. I think that's, a lot of these guys, Amari Cooper, does he have any business being wide receiver 29 to you? Um, meaning like he should clearly be higher. Yeah. Do you, and I think, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about it. Um, I guess one could argue that he doesn't necessarily have this top five receiver upside, but I don't know that I would buy that argument. I mean, we've seen huge games from Amari Cooper and if Amari Cooper came out, there are very few receivers, especially after Cooper Cup in 2021, there are very few receivers um, who came out and had like a 1,700-yard season. It would just absolutely shock me. And Amari Cooper's not one of those. I could easily see him having like a monster, quote-unquote, out-of-nowhere top-five season. He's been such a consistent performer. Yeah, um, I think people get too blinded by upside and the unknown, especially at the wide receiver position. And I do tend to like these older kind of known proven commodities um, because I think you find that they really don't have lower upside than the younger guys. That's been my experience as well. And I think, you know, the whole thing about the quarterbacks, I mean, I like to look at things as the optimism of the unknown, but I mean, the, uh, you know, the uncertainty and it it can lead to negativity and, and create some values. And I think players like that Keenan Allen in particular last year was dirt cheap. There were a handful of them. Uh, always appreciate you coming in there, Kevin. Uh, neither. So everyone knows I'm not like a, a draft. Nick, neither is Adam, but I, I just want to address this question here. Cause I think it's interesting. Jerry Rice's son. We're seeing, you know, Marvin Harrison's son as well, but Brendan Rice going pretty much overlooked. And, and I don't know if you have an opinion on this, but it, but I think if people are, you know, I look at the football guys draft guide right now. It's available. The free version is available. The uh, next version will be out tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> you see, he's like, kind of like the, you know, the, the, the Washington, all the McVay tree kind of offenses or Shanahan, San Francisco, Washington, Chicago. Now they have a need for a wide receiver. They'll be moving on from Darnell Mooney, but, uh, or, but I, but I think rice is down a little lower in the hierarchy. I think, you know, are you drafting on the, uh, on the genetics? Maybe so, but, but, but I see Royal slate out there, uh, a new England Patriots fan will be rooting for the Patriots to draft every wide receiver shotgun style, hoping they get get one right at some point. And Mr. Scamper's totally correct. I mean, this is like Adam Thielen. You know, last year, I was getting him as a wide receiver five all the way up into the start of the season. He obviously outperformed that value. So did Nico Collins, though, younger player. How do you feel about drafting, like, leading weapons in less than uh, robust offenses? The, the saying that you'll hear all year is like somebody has to catch the ball. Uh, And that's not true. That's categorically not true. And I can give plenty of examples of offenses where the answer was no one. Nobody was fantasy relevant. Um, There was a year like 2017 Jets or something, and I'm looking and it's December and their leading receiver had 400 yards. And the answer that year was absolutely nobody on that team. Uh, So I don't like buying based on the fact that like somebody has to catch the ball. Uh, I very much like buying on talent. Um, and and same thing with like rookies. People ask like, what's the ideal landing spot? And the reality is that landing spot doesn't really matter. Like if you remember when A.J. Brown was drafted by the Titans, uh, their quarterback was Marcus Mariota, who was like really struggling, looking like a major long-term liability. Uh, they had Corey Davis there, who was a former top 10 pick. And, oh, Corey Davis is going to be the franchise. Maybe A.J. Brown's going to be the number two. Um, and it's it's a run-first offense with Derrick Henry. And people are like, this is the worst possible situation for A.J. Brown to be in. And like halfway through the season, Mariota's gone. Tannehill's playing out of his mind. A.J. Brown is the most efficient wide receiver in the entire NFL, you know. Then he gets traded to Philadelphia, and this is back when Jalen Hurts, like, can he even throw the ball? He's a run-first gimmick quarterback, and oh, he's going to be competing with Devontae Smith. And again, it's one of the most run-heavy offenses. And again, A.J. Brown's out there, top 10 fantasy wide receiver playing out of his mind. As a general rule, good players get theirs. 
good situation, bad situation doesn't matter so much. Um, and obviously that's not without limits. We've seen Larry Fitzgerald struggle with like Max Hall and John Skelton at quarterback, but by and large, good players like Adam Thielen can succeed in subpar environments, whereas bad players like, um, Sky Moore or um, Rondale Moore or whoever can't succeed even in ideal circumstances. How many wide receivers has New England drafted over the years? And how many people are sitting there in rookie drafts thinking, oh, I'm going to get Tom Brady's number one receiver for the next decade. Um, and the guy's just not any good. So he doesn't produce. So yeah, I, I don't target good offenses. I don't target bad offenses. I, I look for receivers early on. I want receivers who I, I strongly believe are good. Um, and then by the later rounds, you get to the point where all the good receivers are gone and everybody on the board, you think maybe kind of sucks. Um, and so late in the draft, my rule is I'd rather draft a guy who I think maybe sucks than draft a guy who I know definitely sucks. Um, so in, in the later rounds, I'm looking for complete uncertains and unknowns. Um, but, but early on, um, I, I try to tilt my board heavily towards guys who I just, I really feel this is a good receiver. I don't really care where he <clears throat> is, um, but he's a good player and the ball tends to find good receivers. Yeah, I think for me, everyone at the right price. I, I'm fine taking guys like Adam Thielen, Nico Collins, that the people fear are not in great offenses. Uh, if not only because they appear to be good players, but also because uh, you know they're going to have significant roles in their offense. And the price is cheap enough that I don't have to feel like I lost out when I have to bail on them later on. I have a question out here in general. I think, uh, well, comment on this. Uh, it's hard to move Cooper up to past 29 best ball. Who are you taking over him? Olave, Rice, Dell, Metcalf. Like I think all those. I mean, Dell is a guy who's who's shot way up. I mean, he's not getting past the middle of the third round in the drafts I'm in. Uh, Nico Collins going pretty much exclusively in the second round, pretty much as a wide receiver one. And we'll see if he can hold up on that. Where are you at on a guy like Tank Dell? And just like the Texans' offense repeating last year's uh, high end performance with C.J. Stroud. Yeah, that was kind of one of the the big debates of the football guy staff retreat a month or two ago is uh, Nico Collins versus Tank Dell. Um, and I think it's really interesting debate. Um, I tend to be more on the Nico side of things. In reality, like Matt Harmon always says, like the answer can be both. Right. If they're both good, the ball will find them. The, the good players get theirs rule that I that I um, try to follow. It doesn't make allowances for like if there's two good players in an offense, well, then they both tend to produce. Uh, you look at, you know, Waddle and Tyree Kill or A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith or um, Marvin Harrison and Reggie Wayne. Lots of examples of two receivers on a team producing. And sure. probably that would be my guess for the most likely outcome is both Collins and Dell. Um, but if I had to pick one or the other, um, if I'm on the clock in the third round, it's both there and I know they're not making it back to me. Um, I prefer Collins, um, especially in Dynasty, but also in Redraft. Because I think the thing that he does is harder. Um, they line him outside more, and he's he's beating um, number one cornerbacks one on one, and he's running a bunch of these boundary routes. Um, and and it's a harder skill, I think, and it's harder to replace. Um, and that kind of gives more stability. It, it's like the Mike Evans versus Chris Godwin debate from a couple of years back, <clears> where <throat> both were producing, and Godwin might have even been outproducing Mike yeah, Evans by okay. a little bit. Um, but Godwin, like 50% of his catches are coming with linebackers in coverage because, because of the way they're deploying him and the way they're scheming him. And that's great. But I think what we've seen since then is that Evans was actually the more talented receiver. And I think he's held that value better. Um, I think he shocked a lot of people last year. And if I were to take a guess today, it, if, um, Nico Collins and Tank Dell are the next Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, I would say that Collins is more the Evans and Dell is more the Godwin. <laughs> and just, I like, I prefer betting on that Mike Evans profile. Cause I feel like, <clears throat> um, it's a little less contingent. It, it, it's a little less dependent on things breaking a certain way. Yeah. I've been in that camp all along as well. I'm talking to Adam Parstead, the 2023 FSWA fantasy of football writer of the year. My colleague of football guys had a great time at the retreat that you mentioned before. Uh, JC is suggesting he, you know, if it comes down to it to avoid Nico and take the value on tank Dell, you're not getting that much value though. I mean, it's like a round, like if it was a bigger, if there was a bigger difference, I would be with you there. Um, but I'm kind of on the more on the uh, Nico side. 
and 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 I'm not getting a lot of shares because I'm kind of going a different direction in drafts early on so far. So um, <clears throat> I'll have some, but 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 until the price is cheaper on Dell, I'll probably continue going Nico until I get more separation. That's something I end up doing a lot, Adam, and maybe you could comment on this as well. Um, like when I'm looking at situations last year, let's say for example Miami, right? I mean, you had the three running backs, so they were grouped together pretty tightly in ADP. I want to say, you know, late 40s to the mid 50s. Uh, and it was all three of them, and I'm including Jeff Wilson Jr., who I ended up getting a number of shares of because he was the cheapest, but he was cheap enough that it didn't kill me. But that's like, you know, I often take when guys are that close, I'll take the cheapest piece. And I think in a lot of cases, in some cases last year, that was Raheem Mostert ended up on a lot of rosters for that reason alone and had less Devon A. Chan just because he was a little more expensive. When you see like a, those kind of situations late or like receiving course where there's, you know, guys that are, are, you know, all capable, let's say, you know, the Denver Broncos when they have a real quarterback and assuming they will have one here soon enough, you know, is, is there enough of a difference between a guy like Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy? And it's not that great right now, but is there any value in for, to you and taking the cheaper asset when you think guys are fairly equal or are there situations where you would do that? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously the cheaper guy, like the opportunity cost is much lower right. and it's easier to, um, especially late in the draft. Like I'm thinking like, what's the story I need to tell for this guy to become relevant? Cause when you're on the clock in the 16th round and there's, you know, 150 players off the board or more, if you're in a 12, 14, 16 team league, um, basically everybody left on the board are guys that we think are not going to be relevant. Just, if, if we thought they were going to be relevant, they would have gone higher. Um, so any guy in that range for him to hit, we need to be wrong. And so I like, I, I'm usually asking myself, what's the simplest story here? Like who am I most likely wrong about? Um, I wound up with a lot of Kyron Williams last year because the story for like, how does this guy become valuable? Well, you know, Cam Akers, he's, he hasn't looked good in a year and a half. Um, the, there's nobody else on that depth chart. You know, the team's commitment to acres isn't super huge team was raving about Williams last year. Um, they really seem to like him as evidenced by the fact that they're not bringing in more competition, like the story for cam or for Kyron acres to be, or Kyron Williams, sorry, excuse me, um, to be fantasy relevant. That's it's actually a pretty simple story for a guy available in the 18th round or wherever he was going. Um, so that's usually what I'm looking is, is, um, who's got the easiest path, like who needs the fewest things to break, right? Uh, somebody like Raheem Mostert late in drafts, like he's the number one on the, on the depth chart right now. It doesn't even really need all that much. He just needs things to stay the way they are. And he easily justifies draft position. Um, so yeah, it, a lot of times I'm taking the cheapest piece because he's cheapest. Uh, there's times when like there's a situation that um, I want to be a part of. I, I was a big fan of the Ravens um, passing game heading into last year. Um, I was just buying the idea that they were going to open it up and we were going to see some stuff from Lamar Jackson that we hadn't seen before. Uh, and so I was, I'm like, I don't really know who would stand to benefit from this, but I'm just going to take some cheap swings um, at Baltimore Ravens and, you know, okay, I wound up with Rashad Bateman and it didn't really pay off, but that's kind of the process there. Right. Um, where there's sometimes it's not even about the player. It's just like, if this thing happens, there's going to be a lot of residual value. And I just <clears> want to put myself in a position where I'm exposed to that value um, as cheaply and easily as possible. Yeah. That's where we always talk about, you know, you know, the, follow the process, the, you, the, the, the idea, the, the best decisions or the ideal process doesn't always yield the best results because it's football. It's a funny shaped thing and it bounces around in weird ways and all kinds of things happen and there's weather and whatever, you know? So, I mean, you, you follow the, the logic for me. Uh, and also sometimes the, you know, even the more expensive piece is still relatively cheap. So sometimes I do end up with the more expensive piece. Uh, Anthony would like you to know that Andre Isovas will break your rookie model. Um, I, I, I've seen, I've seen you, you know, discuss, talk a little bit about your rookie model. Yeah, I would, I would clarify that he might buck my rookie model, but I, <laughs> no one player can break it. It's not, if your model can be broken by a single player, you don't, you don't have a good model. Um, cause it's, it's, it's not meant to be a silver bullet all in one. It's just a general data point. Um, so my model is based on for years, I had been noticing that yards per route run 
as a rookie wound up being very predictive of future career outcomes. Um, and it was mostly just like a, a list I would post on Twitter of guys who had two yards per route run as a rookie. And it's just like hits from top to bottom. Uh, and so a couple years back, I sat down and I'm like, let's actually like break this down and quantify it because like in reality, there's no reason I should expect yards per route run to just be like a threshold where if you get like 1.99, you're bad. But if you get 2.01, you're good because now you're over two. Right. Um, so I built out something that's like treating it as a linear variable where more is better. And um, I added a term for playing time um, because, you know, if you get two yards per route run, but you're only on the field for 20% of the snaps, this is like the Kadarius Tony profile where you're a gadget guy you get a lot of yards per route run because the team's only putting you on the field when they want to run a gadget play. And then they're taking you back off the field again. So like, yeah, every time you're on the field, the ball is going your way, but you're never on the field. Um, so I just use those two terms. Uh, and I'm a big believer in um, draft position and draft capital, but I, I purposely don't include it in the model because the point is to find um, later round guys who actually wind up going on to be good uh, and so I don't want it down waiting the late round guys. And it, it, um, it's high on like a lot of like sneaky off the radar hits. It loved Stefan Diggs, uh, who was a fifth round rookie. It loved him after his rookie year. It loved Cooper cup, uh, Doug Baldwin, Tyree kill, uh, just the list of like guys who show up very high on the model. Um, it's like an 80%, 90% hit rate where like these guys are going on to be superstars. Um, and then at the bottom of the list, it's it's super, super bleak. If you're in the bottom 20%, uh, basically the only two guys from, from that region who've gone on to be relevant are Jordy Nelson and Devontae Adams. Um, and like, just from a, a process standpoint, like you can look at that and be like, oh, your model missed on Devontae Adams. And if your model's not missing on anybody, you've overfit your model and it's not going to be useful app sample. Like you've, you've just tweaked it so much where it's just describing the past and it's not predicting the future. Every model should have misses just, just philosophically. Um, and, and like, I'm okay saying that Devonte Adams was an outlier and, and the model can't look at Adams and assess his, his resiliency because it, honestly like that might be his most underrated trait like he was he was truly bad his first not just his first year but his first two years um just just really not a good wide receiver but i think a lot of receivers after that kind of start would start to get down on themselves but adam always believed and he was always um working on it and honing his craft and and working like a madman uh and and turned his career around from where it started and yeah, maybe Andre um, Eosivas is going to be like a Devontae Adams. Like maybe he has that kind of mental fortitude and dedication to his work. Uh, and if he is, that's great. Like I, I would love to have a few more misses down at the bottom of the chart just so it doesn't look quite as bleak next time I have to post mm -hmm. it. Um, but on the whole, I, I, people like silver bullets. Like this is an ordered list of like the right. best for worst. <clears throat> And it's not meant to be that. It's more meant to be suggestive that like, hey, he scores really well here. Historically, that's meant good things. You're allowed to like him more or less <clears throat> than what the model says. And in fact, you should. You should consider the model um, and kind of move your priors in the direction of, of whatever the model says. Um, but you're not, you shouldn't substitute it for your own judgment. Right. I feel like we do a lot of things in life and definitely in fantasy football where we try to turn multivariable equations into single variables and and end up, you know, making decisions based on a single thing that's not necessarily the thing that the decision should be made on. It should be made on a wide range of things that you should be taking into account, including things like models. A wall. Uh, Walter wants to know if, based on my recent best ball drafts, have I had success adjusting my dynasty value on player based on their best ball ADP? Not so much. Like, it, I think, like for redraft, I think it's a. First of all, you know, I think best ball is way better than mock drafting <clears throat> because there's money on the line and people are take them way more seriously than mock drafts. And and like I'll experiment a fair amount because I'm doing a lot of best balls, I, you know, and, and I will take chances. And I will try to find different lanes and take different approaches. <clears throat> but I think it's more comparable to redraft. And I'll, I'll say people say, well, you do different things in, in best ball. Yes, you do. You tend to do those later things later, those things later, the different things later in the draft. <clears throat> right. Like, or, you know, I think there's still like the same kind of principles that I follow when I'm doing a redraft. If I'm taking a riskier player 
earlier in the draft or a guy that's, you know, maybe a high upside player, but maybe as a spike performer, I'm evening that out with, with yeah, mitigating that risk with guys that I feel are, are more even producers and things like that. And I think you do the same thing in redraft or best ball with that, but best ball, maybe a little less. So certainly in the later rounds, but for dynasty, it's a whole different animal, right? I think people view it differently and they're not, you know, they're not going to be taking the same kind of chances you're taking in best ball with their dynasty teams. Cause they look at that as a longer term investment than just an experiment, especially this time of year. So no, maybe later in the year, Walter, I'll see more correlation. What do you think? Do you have any thoughts on that, Adam? I'll say one of my favorite heuristics for dynasty, and <clears throat> this is just meant purely as a descriptive statement. I'm not saying whether this ought to be the case, but to, this is the case that um, dynasty rankings and dynasty market values are largely just age-adjusted redraft production, where if a guy is 23 and producing very well, he's going to rank very highly in Dynasty. If a guy is 27 and producing poorly, he's going to rank very low. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily the worst process, but that's just just purely as a descriptive statement. Um, the correlation between like age-adjusted adjusted redraft production and Dynasty rankings is going to be very high, like 0.95. And so one of my favorite things to do is find guys who are very young and who are ranked higher in redraft than they are in dynasty. Because I think redraft is a simpler game. I don't, I wouldn't say easier, but it's simpler. Like the target that you're trying to hit is much smaller. Um, and so I think it's easier for redrafters to be accurate than it is for dynasty players to be accurate. So if the redrafters are saying like Gabe Davis is wide receiver 26 and he's 23 or 24 years old and the dynasty guys are like, no, 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 he's wide receiver 45. I, my thought process is, well, if the redrafters say he's wide receiver 26, I, I bet he's pretty likely to finish right around there, like right around 26. And if anything, he's as likely to finish higher as he is lower. Um, it's, it's It could easily go in either direction. If Gabe Davis is producing like wide receiver 26 at age 23 years old, what's the dynasty community going to do? Well, they're going to shoot him up the rankings. His value is going to go up. Um, so then I'll try to get exposure to Gabe Davis in dynasty kind of as a preemptive play, even if I don't really like Gabe Davis, because I bet three months from now, he's going to be worth a lot more. And if I decide I want off that train, I can flip him. Um, so I'm always, I don't play that much redraft. I do one redraft league a year, uh, the football guys staff league. Um, but I'm always paying attention to redraft ADP. And I'm looking for young guys who, who the redraft community is a little bit ahead of schedule on. Um, and I think it's one of the easier um, places to make a profit in dynasty because it doesn't really involve any judgment like the only the only real thought process is do the redraft players know what they're talking about and generally yeah redrafters have gotten really sharp over the last 15 years redraft adp tends to be very very sharp um so yeah for me that's an easy way to make a profit in dynasty by the way the bills have just made another move today they've made many moves today released a number of players including for davis white and morse their center but they just added a big name mitch trubisky back in buffalo uh, let's all get very excited for that. Uh, so uh, I'm just uh, real quickly, I saw JC had a comment. Uh, true Josh Jacobs ADP is like the fifth round, fourth round. Um, tail end of the fourth round. Uh, it, it depends on where you're drafting. Best ball tens, he's a little bit, a little bit, go, going a little bit higher in on, on underdog. He's like right at the tail end of round four. Uh, Gator wants to know, and hi Gator, and thanks for all the kind comments in there. Um, year two should be better in his opinion for new OC quarterback combinations. I think that makes sense. Ravens should be a better passing game this coming year. Do you have thoughts on this, Adam? Have you lost my sound? Oh, there we go. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Right there for a second. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I honestly like I liked what I saw of Ravens last year, uh, especially I mean, Lamar Jackson, the league MVP. It's not like we were wrong to be high on the Ravens. It, it, it was a slow start. Um, I would not have picked him for my MVP just because I think like the order of the games winds up weighing more than it should. Like he just for the first eight games of the season, he was not Lamar Jackson. The, the the Lamar Jackson we saw in the second half was not the Lamar we saw in the first half. Um, but um, regardless, I think he was a worthy choice. And, and we saw a lot of great things from that Baltimore offense, uh, even with Mark Andrews out um, and with the receivers continuing to ascend. And I know that I am the Mark here. I'm the sucker. Um, there, Harbaugh's already saying great things about Rashad Bateman. And I'm like, all right. 
screw it. I'll probably I hear be it. back in next year. <laughs> I hear uh, it. At the 18th round, it's I'm not there. Painful, I'm, I'm with wrong. you. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with uh, you. So I agree. I, I still really like the Ravens. Um, and I really like um, Lamar Jackson. I think good as a runner that he gets underrated as a passer. Uh, really, the only question to me is going to be the passing volume. So as long as the team is making the right noises in that direction, like he's going to be good passing the ball however much he does it. He just needs to do it enough to kind of support these pass catchers. Yeah, I think you're seeing, uh, I'm seeing a fair amount of Lamar going at quarterback two now ahead of Jalen Hurts. And I mean, not not universally. I mean, there's, you know, there's still, like I've still seen Patrick Mahomes going as quarterback one in some of these drafts, which, you know, seems like a bit of a stretch to me. I think Josh Allen's probably that guy, but, but after that, I mean, I, you know, the top four, you can see him however you want to see him. Lamar for you uh, go, coming into this year, how much ceiling do you think he has? I mean, Todd Munkin clearly wants to throw the ball more. The backfield, we'll see. It's in flux. There's a lot of speculation about some of the available free agents. One in particular, Derek Henry. Uh, seems to be someone that, you know, a lot of us wish cast, uh, you know, him going to Baltimore or a place where he could have a, a, a substantial role, uh, in a good offense. But what do you, how do you view Lamar this year? Where, you know, is he, is he three, four, or is he moving up the ranks for you a little bit? Yeah, I think that's about right. Uh, I, I wouldn't really quibble with anywhere from one to four, um, in dynasty three, four, five, I think he deserves to be right in there. Um, I do love, I love how often we get discounts on Lamar Jackson in Dynasty, um, and and how like sure people are that, um, you know, like he's not going to last very long in the league, and you know it's like four straight years now of people telling us he's he's near the end, he, you know, it, it's it's not going to work, it's a gimmick, the NFL is going to figure it out, and, and no, the NFL is not going to figure it out. He's just really good. There's nothing to figure out. He's just he's just really good. Uh, my one hesitation with Lamar long term is that historically quarterback rushing ages pretty comparably to running back rushing um and you look at the great running quarterbacks of the past um typically by around age 30 31 32 a lot of that rushing value has declined worn away you look at randall cunningham mike vick steve young fran tarkenton john elway bobby lane just all of the great running quarterbacks <laughs> of yesteryear um and they're definitely not the same threat in their 30s that they were in their 20s. Uh, now, the thing I like about Lamar and the reason he's always a good discount is because he's very underrated as a passer. And if he had to transition into more of a full-time passer later in his career, I could see him doing the Randall Cunningham route. Um, I'm not predicting that like he's going to get the best rookie receiver and obliterate all the offensive records or anything, but... Um, I would not be shocked if Lamar Jackson was still going strong at 36. Uh, and if people are going to, or if they're convinced that he's not going to have that kind of longevity and they're going to give me that discount on him, like, yeah, I'll, I'll easily wound up with uh, Lamar Jackson. I think the price is always the factor in all these things. Again, everything at the right price. And uh, and by the way, I, speaking of everything at the right price, I'm going to go cash in my bet that Brant Tarkenton would come up in this discussion at some point because I just had a feeling. Um, so, like, I do think there comes a point where we, you know, we're looking at some of these offenses, and I think we've got, you know, like some built-in thoughts. I think this, the whole Shanahan McVay, you know, that whole tree, that this whole group of people that came from the, that Washington coaching staff years ago under Mike Shanahan. Um, <clears throat> he's done pretty well. I think one of the underrated players in that or coaches in that system is Matt LaFleur. Uh, as you watch the Packers offense, do you pick up any tens? I, I like, I, I see it with a, a lot of coordinators, right. Or a lot of play callers, but I feel like with M LaFleur to me, it seems like really obvious, just eyeball test wise, how he sets up defenses. Uh, just how big of a factor is that for you when you're drafting a fantasy? If you see a scheme or a coach that you feel is like a, playing at a little different level, whether you agree with me on the floor or not, how big of a factor is that in when you're, when you're setting up your drafts and your rankings? I don't know. It's hard. Um, I never really think about it that much. Um, just because I feel like, um, you know, the NFL is a counter punchers league where somebody gets a leg up um, and then everybody copies it. And then somebody figures out how to stop it. And then everybody copies that. And then somebody figures out how to counter mm -hmm. that counter. And then everybody copies that. And it's, it's these series, this constant ebb and flow. Uh, and yeah, that Kyle Shanahan philosophy is ascendant at the moment. Um, but 
I don't think that that's inevitable that that it will remain so. Um, and in fact, I mean, if you look at like the overall offensive numbers, we're already seeing like a major ebb passing yards per game over the last two years is down to like pre 2010 levels. Um, the rise of the cover two largely um, to hinder Patrick Mahomes um, and and players like him, uh, I think has been successfully pushing teams into running more than they were. Uh, and, and I feel like trying to predict all of those trends is very hard and I am very lazy. So I try not to do the hard things as much as I can. And I try to focus on easy things. I, I really like rules of thumb, like draft offenses with good quarterbacks and Jordan loves looks like a good quarterback. So yeah, yeah. I'm all in on green Bay. That's, that's an offense. I absolutely want exposure to again, depending on the cost, obviously. Um, but I, I'm thinking about it and I don't think like play caller or offensive scheme ever really enters into um, my process other than um, Mike McDaniel and the Do and the dolphins, just cause he, fun and mm -hmm. fantasy football is meant to be fun that's part and of it i just too, like right. i just want a piece of that it's just <clears> fun i don't know if it's optimal i don't know if it's ideal <laughs> but like i just like rooting for that so sure yeah. i'll grab i'll grab um mustard or hn or jalen waddle or i'll i'm gonna grab a dolphin somewhere probably um just because i think that will make fantasy more fun for me but other than that yeah i'm not really paying that much attention to scheme I'll paraphrase our buddy Waldman, who kind of described that offense. The McDaniel offense is like a bunch of kick returners. See, they're, they're scheming up guys for a bunch of kick returns. And it's true. And it's, I mean, it is fun as hell to watch. And I think that, I think you kind of encapsulated it though. Like if I see that, if I catch on to something and I, I get that feeling that I, I'm a little more interested in the pieces of that offense. I was like kind of in on Jordan Love or just, you know, had expectations for Jordan Love. And look, it was a, bit of a roller coaster for him right i mean last year and and now he seems to be catching on you should expect that for all players and players do get better where does a uh, question where does love rank for you uh, this year yeah i don't really do i mentioned i do one redraft um a, a year and it's in august and so my redraft prep is i kind of wake up the morning of and i download football guys draft dominator you know i run through one quick mock just to make sure it works and uh and i'm strapped and ready to go um, I'm a big believer in ADP and the wisdom of the market. And so I'm just searching for for values um, relative to ADP. So I don't really have a lot of opinions um, of my own. It's it's I think it makes the draft more exciting because by and large, I don't really have any idea who I'm going to be walking away with, mm -hmm. where I feel like most fantasy players, they have their guys and they're like, I, you know, I want these guys. I want to avoid these guys. Whereas for me, it's all a blank slate. I don't know how it's going to go. Um, I do like love a lot in Dynasty. I play a lot of Dynasty um, and I spend a lot of time thinking about Dynasty. Um, and the hardest thing, you know, the question is, is he cracking my top seven or eight? And and the hardest thing about a top seven is you can only have seven guys in it. Right. Um, or when it, when a position's kind of bereft of talent, the hard thing is you have to have seven guys in it, you know? And I'm like, can I just have five guys in my right. top seven? But quarterback right now is one of those where, like, I want 12 guys in my top seven. Uh, I would not bat an eye if somebody put love in there. Running through a list of names... I don't know if I can fit him in there because uh, you got Mahomes, you got Allen, uh, Lamar Jackson, CJ Stroud, Herbert, Burrow. Um, I know I'm forgetting some names already. Uh, and, and so that's like six. And and now you're starting to get kind of into love and Trevor Lawrence, who I think is a bit overrated. And um, yeah. Uh, you left Anthony Richardson out. We're not here for I left, Anthony Richardson. And slander. I love not here I for that slander. Anthony Richardson. I love here. Anthony Richardson in Dynasty Leagues. Um, just because rushing is such a force multiplier, where like even Tim Tebow was a right. top 12 fantasy quarterback. Can Anthony Richardson be a better quarterback than Tim Tebow? I, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I think he can. I I'm, I'm with you out on that limb and then I'm feeling very comfortable on that limb. I'm like, you know, Richardson is this year, you know, last year, Jameer Gibbs was my nail and I was the hammer this year. Anthony Richardson is my nail. And still there are people in this very chat who are going out of their way to make sure I don't get him in the drafts. We're in together. I don't appreciate that Slade. Uh, I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, yeah. I'm having a hard time landing him because I'm just like, 
fourth round. He's moving up into the fourth round for me. Uh, fifth round, I'm trying, but uh, it's going to take a lot. Bryce Young. Oh, my gosh. No Bryce Young for me. No. no. I I was um, talking about Bryce Young earlier in the year. And the thing about Bryce <laughs> Young, the bad thing about Bryce Young is quarterbacks who suck early tend to suck. Like, typically, if you list of <laughs> quarterbacks who are as bad as Bryce Young as a rookie – it's mostly just really bad quarterbacks. It's not a good sign to play poorly. I don't know if like I'm <clears throat> blowing any minds here, but but typically playing bad is bad. Uh, but the exceptions, <laughs> the guys who were atrocious as rookies and then later turned it around were almost universally very, very, very high draft picks. Troy Aikman, Donovan McNabb, Eli Manning, John Elway, um, Terry Bradshaw, uh, Josh Allen, basically every single one of the exceptions, these guys who played really poorly as a rookie and then later turned it around were high draft picks. That doesn't mean that, that Bryce Young is going to be there. Like, obviously our opinion of him should be lower because he did play poorly. Our opinion of CJ Stroud should be higher because he did play well. But the fact that he was the number one overall draft pick is not irrelevant to the discussion because historically guys like that have been more likely to be thrown in the fire before they're ready, which might've been what happened to him. Um, so if I were a Panthers fan searching for hope, that would be the hope that I latched onto. If I was a Panther fan searching for hope, Dave Canales seems like he's got has at least, you know, helped some quarterbacks out of some bleak periods, but I've said this before, he cannot pass block. And because he's the coach and until they get the right number of pass blockers in there or the right crew of pass blockers, I think it's going to be tough. I, I do think it's like you look at teams like Tennessee where they had a similar issue. They have a really poor blocking last year. They'll work on the personnel, but bringing in a coach like the head coach's dad, Bill Kane, Callahan coming in to work for his son, Brian. I mean, I think there's something to be said for that. But th this is a this is a key thing. People pass protection matters, especially when you have a quarterback built like Bryce Young. I mean, he's not a large guy, right? He needs a little bit of help. And that's not to say guys that aren't big Brees Hall or Drew Brees would like me to know that not all, you know, smaller stature quarterbacks are going to struggle, right? But uh, but right now, that's a big problem uh, for Young. And I don't know that that's going to change in the short term uh, unless they find a whole lot of bodies in a, in a very short amount of time. We've got a short amount of time left, about 10 minutes or so, a little less. Uh, if you have more questions, get them in there. Um, what is your approach to just you know, like big picture, like you're for redraft, uh, you say you're going to do, you have the one, uh, what is your big picture approach to, do you have a strategy you like to lean on? I know everyone's out there. Uh, do you have approaches with the positions that you like to fall back on as a general rule of thumb or is every draft? Like this is one of the reasons I do uh, triple digit best balls is by the time this, the drafts that batter get here, I have a pretty good idea of what I want to do. And something else you said about, you know, drafting ADP. We all know ADP is not when you have to draft somebody. It's when somebody's getting drafted. It tells you where you, if you want a player, what you have to do to get them. I think all these things are ideal and I want to understand all those things, but you know, everyone seems to have their approaches. Do you have an approach or are you just so like wide open uh, to take it, how it comes, or do you try different things? How's it work? Redraft. I'm just, I, I'm, pretty strictly following ADP with a few tweaks here and there, you know, I have my own special sauce, but uh, the idea is, and, and especially like people mistake it to like draft players at ADP. No, I want to get players after their ADP. You know, if there's a guy who's typically going in the second round and he's available for me in the third, that's ideal. I want that because if this guy turns into a league winner, right? Most teams that have this guy are pairing him with the third rounder, whereas I'm pairing him with the second rounder and second rounders are better than third rounders. So like my team is probably better as a result. So, so redraft, um, especially because I think the market is so sharp um, that remember every pick a guy falls past ADP is basically like your league is paying you to take him. They're giving you a bonus. There, there's a bounty on the guy. And if you take the player, you get this bounty and the further he falls, yeah. the bigger that right. bounty gets. Um, so that's me in redraft dynasty. I don't think the market is quite as efficient. And so I will take some swings and I will, um, you know, I'll kind of go out on my own limb in places. Um, one of the things is I like young players who are drafted highly in redraft um, just because it's the market has shown over and over again that like values far more likely to move in that player's direction than away from that player. Um, I'm really big on 
I think ignoring landing spot is a big advantage still um, because people underrate just how quickly it changes. And I gave AJ Brown as an example, but like every top 10 dynasty receiver today, look at what their situation looked like two years ago. And for virtually all of them, it's just radically different. Like nobody's in the same situation they were even within two years. Uh, so dynasty, I'm, I'm really big on, I feel like in the long run, everything is downstream of talent. And if you get good players, good things tend to happen. So dynasty, I'm managing my teams in the way that I think just gives me as much exposure to as much talent as I can possibly get. Um, and, and by and large, you know, my approaches are things like that. I like really simple rules of thumb. Um, there've been studies that like complex models will perform really, really well. If you're in situations with like bounded uncertainty, like chess, there's only so many moves the pieces can make. The, 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 the possibilities are bounded. Now the, the boundary is huge. Um, the, the number of possible chess games, it's called the Shannon number. And it's just this famously huge number. Um, but it's bounded. Like the rook is not all of a sudden going to turn into a dragon right. and light the board on fire. Whereas football is much more like, like right. <laughs> completely unbounded. And in situations of unbounded uncertainty, uh, the stock market is another famous example, like very, very simple rules of thumb wind up performing phenomenally well, um, where, you know, like the, the 2008 financial crisis, there were all these models that were treating the stock market like a thing with with bounded uncertainty. And then all of a sudden something that nobody anticipated came and it just like knocked over everybody's Black board. Swan. Right. Or, or, or coronavirus, like everything's trucking along. And then all of a sudden, like a virus is spread. It, it crosses the, the animal to human barrier halfway across the world. And like for six months, we didn't leave our house anymore. Uh, so football, I I'm as simple as I can make it, but no simpler. Right. I think the, the great thing about football is the, like, it's, uncertain by design. I mean, that's the desired outcome. It's not like something that's happening by accident. It's happening because they want it to happen. Interesting trade here. I like this. Traded JSN and Ken Walker for Anthony Richardson. And I, I'm assuming that's Dynasty. And I would be pretty hyped to myself. Um, JSN, like, I feel like he's, maybe I would have felt better if he had the same coordinator in the same circumstance. Because I do think, just the same coaching staff. I felt like Pete Carroll brought in Shane Waldron to head towards more of a Ram style offense. And that maybe at some point JSN could become like the Cooper cup type figure in that. And I know we like to project out and say somebody's the second coming of somebody, but you know, you're trying to anticipate roles. Um, I don't know if that role will ever materialize or I don't know what to expect of that role. I like, I want that Anthony Richardson lottery ticket so bad that I will do almost anything to get it. Um, what do you think about that trade? Yeah. Um, I typically, I, think I would find myself as a buyer on JSN um, just because again, everything's downstream of talent. And I think it's still more likely than not that he's a good receiver. Um, but the one thing with, with rookie wide receivers is typically like they don't lose value in their first <clears throat> year. Um, and you look at even somebody like Nikhil Harry, who had about as catastrophic of a rookie year as he could have his dynasty ADP fell by like eight slots. Like, half a round around very little value loss. Um, and I call this the rookie mulligan where if there's a rookie receiver who, who players like, they're going to give him a mulligan. They're going to say, okay, he didn't produce, but he was a rookie. So they give him a pass. The problem with that is that once the second year rolls around and that mulligan's gone, if he is not producing quickly, the bottom is going to fall out in a hurry. So JSN in theory, I like him, but just speaking strictly as, as an asset on a dynasty roster, he is very, very volatile. If he is, if it's November and he's like the wide receiver 50 in fantasy, you're not going to be able to get anything for him. <clears throat> so I think the safer move is probably to move away from him now while you're still benefiting from that mulligan. Right. Um, even if in theory, it's the kind of profile that I typically like to have. Uh, outside of football guys, ADP, I, like, I, I think we all get our ADP from the various drafts going on. So I don't think, it, you know, I trust, I uh, honestly, I trust the one that I develop internally. And again, it's like why I want to be steeped in these drafts right now. I want to have a feel, I want to be in a draft. I don't want to make moves or, you know, when you get someone pulled right out from under you, right. And you get sniped in a draft and you make that panic response pick. I don't want to make that panic response pick. I always want to have three or four picks in my pocket that I feel comfortable with. And the more I draft, the better I feel about that. So I trust all the ADPs, but 
mostly I trust the one that I develop in my own tiny little brain over the course of uh, months of drafting. And so it, it's, it is a field thing, Gator, for me. But, but I think all about there, as long as they're basing it on actual drafts, I think the best balls for me are a little more realistic, at least in the early rounds, because, again, money on the line. Um, and mock drafts, I do not trust them. I, mean, I don't know what people are going to do. People, like, bail halfway through it. So, <clears throat> all right, everybody, there we have it. Adam Harstead, 2023 Fantasy Football Writer of the Year, according to the FSWA, and me, Bob Harris. Uh, I say this, and I know I'm always right. Um, appreciate the time, man. Uh, what, what should people be looking for from you? Tell them a little bit about, you know, your accessibility on the uh, X machine. Yeah, I'm at I'm on uh, Twitter, which I will still I'll probably call it Twitter. Till I, I, die. I, I live in Chicago. I still call it Sears Tower. Like you'll never catch me calling it Willis Tower. Uh, so, you know, the name is the thing that people know it as people know it as Twitter on Twitter. I'm at Adam Harstad. Same as the name. A-D-A-M-H-A-R-S-T-A-D. Uh, and then, yeah, football guys, um, I'm still kind of working out what the roadmap's going to look like for 2024, but as soon as you guys know, it'll be up on football guys. Yeah, and you and Waldman have a, <clears throat> have a nice little thing going as well, so everyone should check that out on mattwaldmanrsp.com. Um, and also go check out his rookie scouting portfolio, A for One's Coming People. Um, and the Football Guys Draft Guide is out right now, version 2, uh, with the RAS scores, all kinds of fun things added will be available tomorrow and uh, i'll have articles on going saturday uh football diehards on the radio show the fantasy sports radio will be two of three three p.m like i got to do the time zone translations in my head and i'm not very good at that three to five every saturday until we get close to the draft and then you're going to find us all over the place again so stick around for that i'll be back here saturday we'll discuss my non-vacation vacation and uh take all your questions and discuss things even more i appreciate y'all coming and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Dad.